Greetings, campers! Welcome to the world according to Yoni. Uh, for anyone who hasn't figured it out yet, I am your host, Yoni Martin. Uh, I've been doing the show for about a year and a half now, so I, I hope you figured it out, or the fact that I'm sitting here welcoming you, you know, that should do it. Uh, this is my first show of 2022, and you know what? I'm not jinxing it by going Happy New Year and all that kind of crap because I did it last year and God knows 2021 was maybe one of the years worth that worst years on record. And here we are in 2022 and it already sucks. So um, I am going to try to keep my promise uh, made in the last show by not talking politics today. Of course, with my guest, that may be impossible, but we're going to give it a shot and see what happens. Anyway, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, bring on a woman who I am proud to be able to call a friend. Uh, she is funny, smart, talented. She is a wonderful stand-up. She is the first openly lesbian comic to have her own HBO special, and uh you may have seen her on the Stephanie Miller show. She was on, uh, she's done TV. She's a wonderful actress. Uh, so please welcome, if you will, Suzanne Westenhofer. Hello, Suzanne. Oh my God, we did it. <laughs> there, there's a cattail waving in the, uh -uh. No, no, uh -uh. what is it? What is it? She would not be up on the bed. Oh yeah. That's no. like, no, no, I don't I don't have any, I don't have any issue with that. Um, it's that, um, this is my little ditty in. She's, uh, I've had a million cats. I'm a, I'm an ex farm girl. Uh, she doesn't like me during the pandemic. <laughs> she does, she doesn't care for me during the pandemic. Um, she decided, oh, well, she's going to be here 24 seven. So like late in 2020, she started to go, all right, let's see what you're about. You know what I mean? And so now when I sit on the bed to do these, sometimes I sit on the bed with my computer like this and she goes, she gets up on me. There's only like four times. I've had her four years and she just started doing this. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe yeah, she loves me. I've noticed animals over the last two years have uh, started the, you know, having their people around more. Oh yeah. Like, it, well, it's been very big deal for them. Think about it. Even if you let say you had a dog and you had a great have two. Okay. So you probably have great relationship with at least one of them, if not both. Right. Yes, and then suddenly for my standpoint, having, I'm never, I was never with them more than like four days in a row. <laughs> and then suddenly you're never gone. I did a thing on one of my little zoom shows because she went in my closet and I swear to God, she pulled my, one of my uh, soft suitcases half out. And I was all like, suggestion. <laughs> Should I be seeing this? In some <laughs> sort of message. Go away. Go. This is my house. You, 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 when you use this, things are better. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I, I understand completely. I'm losing my voice, which why? Why? Because did you use it all the time, or did you do anything special? <clears throat> Nothing worthwhile, if that's what you're asking. Sorry. Yeah. One thing I have to ask you after I adjust my mic here. Um, I just want to make sure in my introduction, I was saying that you are, uh, to my knowledge anyway, the first openly lesbian comic to uh, appear on American television. Sally Jesse Raphael, I believe and have your own HBO special. Have my, own, hey, have my own HBO special. Absolutely true. There's like, Leah Delaria will argue that I was the first one ever on TV. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I am. Okay, so do do I, I don't think Leah watches this show. So I, we would, we would watch All you can Leah. hope, that's all you can hope. I don't know if you know her, she's a lot. Uh, I have watched her perform. Uh, I actually watched her do uh, a musical number on something. Oh, yeah. I didn't know she could That's sing her. and move like that. Wow. Yeah, she, her, um, 
I'm not a fan. I've known her for since I started. Um, sh- uh, but her music and stuff is what people have. She did better with that than comedy. Way yeah, better. Well, That's what she, got her acting roles. Everything. I mean, yeah. Yeah, she's really good. I was shocked. I was like, I I knew of her as a comic. So, you know. Oh yeah, I know. But not not a not a good uh, couple of weeks for comedy. Has it been? Uh, what are you trying to say? <laughs> what am I trying to Why say? Why don't you just adjust that fucking mic? <laughs> Is it adjusted? I'm kidding. Yes, Sorry. it's adjusted. Um, no, it's a. Uh... Well, the Bob Saget death uh, really seemed to crush a lot of people, and it has completely blown my mind because I met him my very first times at Catch a Rising Star and Comic Strip and stuff when I first passed. What they call Pat, where they let you get up in the comedy club. I remember. I remember. Right? And um, I, uh, he was horrible to me like consistently there was actually uh there are two times where his kind of dismissal of me and stuff was so sort of a, a, people were aware of it that joy behar once kind of went bob, bob. <laughs> <laughs> and brett, but, brett butler who was known to be mean to everybody actually like stepped in front of me and talk to him like this. And I was like, uh, so I never really thought of him as a great guy. And then anything I ever did for like the first two years I did stand up, anytime, anytime I was at an event or doing something, he just was so dicky to me. And then I, honest to God, I never saw him again live, maybe here and there, you know? Um, and I heard that, and I knew he was a dirty comic. I knew that reputation. I knew that he was a bit of a womanizer. I knew about the drug, you know, the, like everybody in the States. You're talking the 90s, right? Yeah. And um, Not me, though. Right. But, and I didn't watch Full House. I wasn't the right age group. It hit me wrong, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, he dies, and everybody is, like, lifting him on his sh- their shoulders and all this. And I'm going, did I? Was he just mean to me? I don't know. It, it just freaked me out because he's a year younger than me. 65. Um, yes. No, uh, he's not old enough for this for me. You know, and that and that that in and of itself, you know, barely older than I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And in uh, part. so and also because he was from Norfolk, Virginia, where I lived for a number of years. Oh, OK. So there was that connection. Um, yeah, sure. But, Did you know? Him? No, I, I never met him. Uh, oh, never even met him. Okay. No, I never even met him. Which is surprising because I'm I think like, yeah, you were in the New York clubs. We started around the same time. So I don't know how I missed him. When did you start? When do you call your start? <clears throat> the first time around, I think it was 77. Something. Oh, wow. So you were 15 years old. You were three years yeah, old. Yeah, that's it. I was, I, I was a kid. I was very, very you young. Uh, but you know what? I forgot. I forgot to tell you this uh, because... Uh, at the advice of a, uh, a, a career coach, uh, I started doing stand-up again because she said- uh, Oh, you had stopped. If you wanted, yeah, I had stopped for years. And, oh, I didn't realize that, Yoni, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I stopped. I, I call myself a reformed comic, meaning I sucked, so I stopped. Um, but- you know, I don't have my little brother's excuse. He was a great comic, but he stopped to be a stay-home dad with his daughter when she was born. Yeah, that's... Because his wife was making more money than he was. That wins in America, baby. Yeah. But uh, but I for- I completely forgotten that this, this woman told me uh, to start doing stand-up again because uh, that was where they were looking for actors for sitcoms. So uh, right. Linda, Linda McCartney died uh, around that same time. 80s then, huh? late 80s? Can't, yeah, no, it was, it was, I think, late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Uh, but oh, you might have been, so, yeah. So the first routine I started doing when I went back to it was, you know, here the biggest proponent of vegetarianism and a healthy lifestyle dies of cancer in her 50s. 
Uh, Aren't you old enough to remember? And I actually, if I say one name, two words, you'll remember how we mocked this forever. Jim Fix. Oh my. The man who wrote the very first book about running for your health. And it was on the Today Show and Good America. Everybody, no, everyone was talking about it for like five years. He was the man to teach us how even after 30, you can go running. And you remember, it was all very like, what? We can get healthy. La, la. Boom, heart attack, running, dies, 50. Oh, I've got a better one. There was a Carlton, Carlton Fredericks. Carlton Fredericks was, a, he was earlier. Um, he was a guy who was big on vitamins and supplements. Okay. And, you know, Mr. Healthy Lifestyle. Yeah. Kills over on the Dick Cavett show. Boom. Dies right there. Um, That's awesome. I shouldn't be laughing, but. I mean, not awesome, but it's just to be, well, only because, yeah. It's I mean, 40 something years later, I think we the can. The stupid do. irony of it. You can't help but laugh. Come yeah. on. You know, I don't want anybody to drop dead. It's just that, come on. Somebody gets famous for something like that and then drops dead in a way, the public way that we can see. Dude, you're going to get mocked by comics <laughs> for 150 years after you die. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, what, what, what we do. What do? I, I, by the way, I should tell my audience uh, the history of what <laughs> of what it took to get here. Uh, the fact oh, that the God. last time we were on Zoom, uh, we, we chatted too much about ourselves, our, our life. We caught up. Yeah, it was it was hysterical. I mean, I was looking at the tape and I'm going, well, great. This is two, is any of this. two friends catching up on everything they have in common and everything they've done. For like two hours. For, for two hours. And nothing much usable for the show on that. And then, of course. A lot of me too. I did that. I thought that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then rescheduling you had a bad morning yesterday i am uh, so sorry about that don't, don't worry it's been, about a, it. it's been a rough two years can i just go on can i be the first to say yeah, that please <laughs> tell me how rough it's been i, I want to know um there's like a global i know like the whole world pandemic i know it's are you crazy. kidding no i haven't heard you gotta get out of the basement so yeah you're not <laughs> getting literally uh but at least it's not flooding. Uh, and I don't oh. have rats crawling around like somebody else we know. Uh, Steph. Story. No, I know. I knew. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You've heard. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. I saw some of the pictures. It was like, Jesus. Um, but yeah. So we did two hours for ourselves. And now here we are trying to do this again for an audience. And I, I hope we can I'd enjoy pull, it. Pull it off. We were going to, I, originally we were going to talk uh, like it was because it was right after Betty White died. And Wasn't we it never, like that day or the day, the day after? It was the day after and we never even got to her. And I was like, I was thinking, how could we have not even discussed that? Are we that cruel that we forgot Betty White? Oh, that's that. That's very uncool. I mean, everybody. I wish that she had lived to hunt to a hundred just for her the history of it doesn't mean anything to her really, you know what I mean? Just for the fun of it. But um, I was not sad that she died because I don't want to live till I'm really, really old. And I, I'd heard around here in high live in Hollywood that, you know, she was struggling out. I mean, she was going to be a hundred, right? And she was really, really focused on trying to get through a hundredth birthday party. Exactly. That was, that's why I'm pissed. You know, she had a great life. Everybody loved her. She was a phenomenal human being. She was a wonderful actress. And she lived a great life. But there was going to be a party this week. That now I think to myself, what if she would have died during one of those parties? And it was on, that would have been one of those deaths that would have, we couldn't have taken it after these two years of all this shit. We'd have been uh, like, I think people would have just committed Harry Carey right on their yards it, it, it's insane it really is uh i'm you know with, with the bob saget thing i'm more uh heartbroken about uh to be perfectly honest dwayne hickman uh who was dwayne hickman was Wait, a I comic know. actor director he played dobie gillis in the many Lo yes, loves yes yes of thank you dobie gillis opposite bob denver playing his best friend maynard g krebs a beatnik um, and the famous lesbian who's now one of our city council. Yes, yes. When I had, even though Sheila, 
Hey, just Sheila Cool. Um, yeah. just went out of my yeah. So yeah, and and also Dwayne Hickman in Cat Ballou, which I is my favorite all-time Western. Oh wow. Because it's a send-up. And yeah, exactly. He has my favorite well, line. I questions, do you? <laughs> oh yeah. So I was, you know, for me, that was that was I big because that's I feel like my childhood keeps getting taken away from me when these people die. And it's, you know, it's it's very strange. So um, John Belushi, John Lennon, very both in my college, I think it was my college year, first two years of college or whatever. And I would, you know, so what are you, you know, 18 and 19? Those were the ones that probably ruined me for any others to be because I was so young and I was so like, ah, oh. <clears throat> and that was my, those were my first. They were real close together. It was a whole thing. It's like, oh my God, oh my God. I real was ending. my John Lennon story. Uh, my manager at the time also did PR for the New York City Police Department. Oh, wow. Well. And as soon as the word came into the police department, what had happened, they called him because he was going to handle PR for the police. Oh, got it. I got it. He knew that I was a John Lennon fanatic, you know, that as a musician, he you was- You can barely tell by your hair and glasses and stuff. Really? Uh, I, no, I, I, really? I've tried to hide it. You know, it's, okay. it's, I'm, I'm glad to know that works. But he called me because he knew I was a Lennon fanatic. Uh, so I knew before 90% or more of New York knew. And I made a beeline over to the uh, wow, to 72nd Florida. Street to the uh, Dakota, Dakota, you know, and wow. as I'm going there, I hear over the radio, uh, Yoko Ono is asking people not to show up. And I end up in a crowd of thousands upon I'm thousands sure. of people. Yep. But we had to be there, you know, if you could get there, you had to be there because it was just, it was. Oh, Tear your heart out. Yeah, it did. The first um, Beatle, everything about that was just so. I don't, I don't know that any real Lennon fan has ever gotten over that because it was just so horrific. And the timing of it was. Insane. And then what happened? Meaning he wasn't killed in the car accident. He didn't drug, uh, drug overdose, wasn't a plane crash. He literally, what? Some guy who wanted his autograph? shot him he gotten his autograph earlier in the day oh that's right yeah but who yeah. does that like that was just too it was craziness too yeah it was in it was really insane um yeah. so that was for me that was yeah that was the big one uh but we're real we're, we're on death here i don't want to be on i right know I, I, like, I, I, I think i guess I, w I really just wanted to say um i was really uh okay about her dying uh, about betty white dying at home alone with her peeps because i it kept occurring to me as we were going to her 100th birthday she's not gonna like die in the at the event or one of those events because there were tons of events and different things she's gonna do them all that's who she is yeah. right um i've met i've been lucky enough to meet her twice uh oh, I did. I, that is very lucky i wish i had she did um and i have a friend who wrote a bunch of those books on the golden girls who's met her a billion times i met Betty White twice, uh, B. Arthur four, maybe even six times, uh, Rue McClanahan once at LAX in the um, uh, luggage. And I was so excited because I was like, I felt like I, it was Pokemon. I got all three. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had gotten any of them, the Stel Getty, uh, you know, who- I didn't actually... get to meet Stel Getty at all, yeah. I love I love the fact that Estelle Getty was younger than B. Arthur. Yeah, right. And B. Arthur wasn't a big fan of Betty White's. Uh, no. It's like you get to read all this stuff now because it's now. coming back up. Now I know. Oy vey. Uh, so but let's doubt. talk about you, Suzanne. We are here to talk about you. You know, the little the little girl from Pennsylvania. Not who, just Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Lancaster Dutch County, Pennsylvania, <laughs> home you know, of the Amish. Yeah, and you're not Amish though. Still not. And <laughs> still not. <laughs> sure, I get the pamphlets all the time, but I'm not. I'm just not feeling it. And, and uh, it's very strange having. Uh, it must be having grown up around that. 
it, and, there's no strangeness if you grow up around it because it's in your life and you think it's as normal. What was weird is when I'm 18, I go away to college up in northeastern um, northeastern Pennsylvania, um, north western Pennsylvania, one of those, up near Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, and, I know um, you're. I've actually been to Erie. Okay, so it was Clarion. It wasn't in Erie. It's just in that general vicinity. And there were so many things that I didn't realize about Lancaster County, the Amish, all that stuff, and how I didn't understand that people were fascinated by it. Because I'm like, why? Or that they <laughs> will spend money to go and see them. Um, why? Uh, like, I didn't have any sense of that. I knew very, very few Amish, um, but I knew some. And my mom, because my mom was a, a secretary for an eye doctor, and he was the only eye doctor they would go to because he his family had had a farm in their area for generations, so they knew him. He wasn't the English, as they call uh -huh, people. Well, yeah. yeah, that they I don't even know if they do that anymore. But and so some of them would come in and they would become uh, patients because they only come for emergencies. And um, uh, so my mom would take us to the Amish farm. The Stausfus family was the main family, and she would take us. And because I, I used to make jokes about it's not exactly true, but I would, you know, how comedy you make it bigger. Um, they had kids and then like the all the adults would go off to talk and the kids were expected to play together. But little Amish kids don't have the same pop culture you have. So I very clearly remember being like eight and these little Amish kids and saying, well, all right, let's play Batman. What? And they're like, what's that? I'm like, OK, let's play, you know, and you're. Uh, I'll be Dorothy and you be the lion. And they're like, no matter what I, any little games that you thought of. No so reference to, worked. But you had to go all back school. Wait, I mean, you couldn't even do cowboys and Indians for them. Um, <laughs> you had to go all the way back and be, it was like, all right, how about tag? If I touch you, you lose, <laughs> right? How about hide and seek? Because they didn't have that. And then the one of the last times I was ever on the farm, I was probably 13 or 14. And, you know, it's the same kids, you've seen them and there's like six of them. And that now they don't even want to play games. They want to drink corn mash alcohol <laughs> that they've made, right? And I'm like, I'm four, I'm like 13 and I haven't even really done that yet. But the Amish kids are all like, try it, you know? Yeah, the, it's Here's really a cigarette. strange. The Amish kids who go to New York oh. and get into drugs oh, and all, all that crap. Because, yeah, it's that's really that, what's that, rumspringa. It's called Rumspringer. Yeah. Right. Go. <laughs> I couldn't pronounce it, but I, I remember the word. Yeah. Well, it's and, a German word. But you you had some interesting experiences growing up there. Uh, you were a little older. I, I'm going to let you get to what I'm alluding to. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Since you've done your stand up on it, like your first sexual. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Um, well, for whatever reason, and I think it's comes, I think it's genetic. I am, um, I am, I've always been interested, excited by sex. Like I never had fear of it. I never was like, ew, or anything that all, all children are. I was- uh, I'm in your boat actually, so Thank you. yeah. And I don't know if people were reading, about, if I was, it was cause I was reading a lot of adult books or whatever, but I just, <laughs> I, I was aware of it and I knew about it and I couldn't wait to do it. Just couldn't wait. Yay. And I wasn't finding anybody and very, and by the time I was 13, I was very aware that like boys in, that were my age and in, in high school were idiots. And um, that was not going to work out. I was afraid it would suck. And I decided to get a, I like, I sort of fabricated, I did it too. I fabricated a crush on this older guy who lived across the street and he was married. Um, he was 41. I'm 14. His the reason I chose him is because his marriage was over. Everybody, you know how people gossip in a little town, and we're all in those row homes, yes. so we know everything all about everybody. Well. <laughs> um, and his wife, the their last son, who was my age, was like um, at the time 14. They was the the his his dad was really the chief of police because his wife had been fooling around on him for so long that, you know what I mean? And so everybody knew that. So I figured he was safe. Like I thought he was safe and he was a sort of, he was a good looking guy, but he was a wimpy guy. Like one of those guys that not a macho boy. 
Yeah, and you've, so, you've said. <laughs> yeah, so I went after that. I wanted to have sex with him and, and it never occurred to me that like he wouldn't want to because I was 14. <laughs> I was like, I had a hot body. I was 14, you know what I mean? Everything was all standing up, <laughs> nice and tight. Um, and I wanted to have sex. So I sort of, sort of pretended to have a crush on him then I kind of got a crush on him because I was sort of the romance of it. You're 14. I'm writing poetry, you know. And so I, I slept with him for like a year, but we got caught. And even in Pennsylvania. Oh, we froze. Um, again. You froze what? for a second there. So and you're freezing again. Stop freezing. I'm not even doing anything differently. OK, so go back. So he got caught. You got caught. We got caught, um, and like I said, in Pennsylvania, even in 1975, 14-year-old girl, 41-year-old boy was illegal. Yeah. And so uh, they arrested him. Um, but they didn't really arrest him. They just sort of yelled at him. <laughs> I, got, I got yelled at, too, by the cops. In the middle of the night, they came. They, they prepared it with my mom. I just had my mom. My dad was out of the house when I was two. Um, he left. Uh, and I, um, they took me to the police station downtown in this little tiny town of like 9,000 people. So everybody knows everybody, everything's, you know. Oh my God. And so it, like at three o'clock in the morning, they took me into this thing with like four other policemen, including state police. And they were all like, what happened? What happened to this? Did you, did you do this, did you do this? And I'm all like, and all of a sudden it was like, I, I've, I've always lived my life like I'm in a movie that I'm Susan Hayward and it's the last 20 minutes of the movie. And I'm all like, is that what you want to hear? Do you want to hear the dirty details? Is that what you're looking for? And so I basically just jerked them off vocally for a, a couple hours. And then I learned so much from that. I learned that men were, uh, men were going to be easily controlled by their penises more than I even thought. Meaning I didn't even have to have sex with them to be able to control them with because of their penis. And I went, that was then my like, the world is my oyster. I'm going to be able to oh, control. Oh yeah, you, you've learned everything. everything you need to know about males <laughs> at 14. Um, but uh, it, you know, and and then also, so then I in the town like that, and see, everybody knew everything. So by the time I get to high school for 10th grade, which is 15, I'm the Lolita homewrecker. Right, because oh back then a girl, then nobody looked at it as I was abused. No one looked at it as statutory rape. No one looked at it as there was none of that kind of stuff. Wow, I, it it was my fault, and I was wrecking a home, and because he was married, you know, um, and uh, then I met, and so no boy would date me. Um, so I was flirting with a lot of older men, but one guy came up in tenth grade because he, he was a Catholic kid, and he had been going to Catholic middle school Good. he came in so he didn't know all the history of me so to speak and uh he 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 liked me and so we dated um and he had never had sex before and i'd already had sex now for a year you and once you have sex you can't stop it's not like uh, you're gonna have sex for a year and then go oh i better stop now till i'm married yeah that's kind of been my experience uh stop so he and i had sex and i got pregnant right away right because um, the guy had had a, uh, not a hysterectomy. What do guys have? He got his- Vasectomy. Thank you. <laughs> and so- I feel like covering myself when I say it. It's like- I, <laughs> I do too. And I don't even have to, like, uh, <laughs> It's one of those words. So I didn't, I had forgotten. I just sort of forgotten about the whole birth control. I knew all that stuff. So, but I got pregnant. And then, uh, so now it's 1977, summer of 1977. And I, um, I get pregnant. And I have an abortion, which it was 1977, so it was legal. Um, different times. Yeah. Holy shit! It was new. Your neighbors easy. weren't going to get ten thousand dollars for turning you in. No. Oh my god! I'm so horrified by what's happening. And uh, I mean, I wasn't thrilled about it. It was what it was. You know what I mean? And uh, so. I, and that was a kind of a big deal. And my dad had come for visitation and I was cranky to him. I didn't, we didn't get along anyway, but, and my, he was all like, what happened? And while my sister, my oldest sister, who was religious and weird and is still a virgin at 64. So 
form your own conclusions about that. Not a lesbian, just a virgin. Uh, yeah, better a lesbian, it, she, I think. She told this woman she worked for at a grocery store and that I'd had an abortion. And I remember in this town, I'm already the Lolita homewrecker. So now I'm in 10th grade and I'm the homewrecking Lolita baby killer. Oh, I mean, God. kids I had known since I was in, um, uh, what is it, kindergarten, were not allowed to hang out with me or talk to me. And so I'm the lead in all the plays and I'm, <laughs> a, a, I'm an AB student. I'm, I start a dance squad. I start um, a gymnastic squad. I do all this stuff, but um, nobody can be friends with me because their parents won't allow it. Well, I mean, come on, you were a slut, right? I'd be I'd proud say, of it myself, but the way I got into comedy is I said I didn't start out as a lesbian. I was a very successful heterosexual, <laughs> or as I call it, a whore. <laughs> and that was it. But then, so when I went to college and I came home uh, from college and said, "Mom, I'm a lesbian." This is a true story. My mom, a single mom in the '60s, you don't know how hard her life was. Um, and then me, after my two sisters who never did nothing, they never broke a rule. They never broke a rule. They were sweet, they're shy, they're quiet, they don't curse. Um, and I all of a sudden do all this crazy stuff, leave, leave for college, I'm the first one to leave for college. I come home on break, mom, I'm a lesbian. And my mom's like, honey, I think that's best. <laughs> and that's where that went. You know, with all that material, you had no choice but to I be know. a comic. It's like- Was it to write books? And, 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 and I can attest, you have done <laughs> routines on all of that. So yes. uh, I know. I, in fact, um, I did, uh, I did something about having an abortion, terminating a pregnancy. I say when it's mixed company sometimes, uh, meaning there's conservatives in the room. <laughs> oh, I thought it was because the cat was listening or Catholics, Catholics. Um, somebody really hates it. Um, I remember thinking, because this was about right after Texas had passed their law and I had, it wasn't on Zoom, but it couldn't have been much more than a year and a half ago when that law got passed a year and a half to not, it was right at the beginning. I did one thing somewhere out, you know, outdoors, some little thing we were doing in 2020. And I remember thinking, am I going to be able to tell this story anymore? Or is this going to be like a thing where all of a sudden the audience is all like, you did what? Because it's never been, you, when you're on stage now and you're a comedian and you say, a female comedian, you say, I terminated a pregnancy or I had an abortion. It's not like people are like, well, good for you. But it's, <laughs> they don't freak out or anything. They know that women get them. <laughs> it happens, yo. Yeah, it, it and, does happen once or twice a year. And yeah. I'm obviously over 40 and they know it was a long time, right? You know, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's weird because now I'm like, I'm John, Yanni, I'm really tru truly thought, thought, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about it when we start up again in a more normal way with comedy after COVID or during whatever happens, happens, but we get back to whatever we're going to be doing. Will I even be able, the way I tell the story about me and that older man and the way I tell a story about having an abortion, like that's all changed. People think I was groomed by him. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy was not smart enough to understand what grooming means. But it was, it's still a funny routine, Suzanne. I mean, I think so. But will people have changed is what I'm saying. Will it? Will I, it I don't think, I don't think so. I, okay. I don't think the majority of people I hope will not. have changed. And let's get real. The ones who really will care are, are not the ones who are going to be showing up to They're see. They're not going to be in the comedy club. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So. Good point. Yeah, so I don't think you really have to worry about that. I'm not going to talk about it in Texas in case somebody decides if they're going to do some retroactive thing. Except that if they do that where it's retroactive, where they do that for somebody, even if it's five years, I'm going to lose my fucking shit. You're going to see me on TV everywhere because I'm going to be going, are you telling me all these women who said they were raped and they said there's a statute of limitations? And they're not allowed to remember that? They, they can't charge anything? Oh, they, they'd never get but away I can, get, I can abort a baby 40 years ago and you can say something to me? Fuck you. I'll go nuts. Uh, you know, actually, it would be a great test case because. True story. I'm willing to do it. I don't give a shit. I like your spirit. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh, I'm oh, I have been an activist my whole life. You know, the only reason I started comedy was the way the activism. I never even considered comedy. I was going to be a great movie star, a yeah. brilliant actress. Well, you know, Awards. we talk 
We, we, we talked about how my parents met at the uh, a meeting of the New Deal Democrats. Which I love. And so, you know, I was, my family, we were all brought, my brothers and I were all brought up as activists, still mm-hmm. are. Uh, I mean, if you go through my entire family, both sides, I think we have one Republican. And- yeah, we don't, I, you know, I, I love that you were raised that way too. My mom was uh, political and cared. She was not an, she had three jobs the whole time I was growing up. She was not, she didn't have the time to be an activist. Um, and, uh, but I grew up in a family that was, you know, like you, to not vote was like the worst thing you could ever do. You, you didn't vote. What? Oh yeah. And you had to care about stuff and you had to be, and it was encouraged for you to be verbal. It was encouraged for you to stand with the, the four black kids who were being yelled at or whatever was going on. Yeah. <clears throat> and <clears throat> in my family, I saw it. And I also saw how other families didn't do that. And what, what I mean, very early on, I saw that there's people that care and are going to be involved in this society that we're trying to create. And there's people that are not going to be involved in it and are lazy. I didn't know until I was much older that there are people who are actively trying to crush the society that we've built. Yeah, well, I, I mean- I, Or change it so that- In the last five years of or people so, aren't it's gotten beyond anything any of us could have imagined. Ever. I mean, and, I mean and we lived through Nixon for Christ's sake. And I'm, as a I New Yorker- period, I got my, my very first period when he was president. <laughs> I always remembered that that somehow fit. You're not equating this to that, right? It wasn't Nixon's fault. And I, I just feel like it was so appropriate for me to bleed once I understood he was president. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was. Because I, I was 11. I was just learning about politics. I was just. Yeah, learning- and I came from a very activist school. My high school was very activist. And that's I mean, cool, too. We walked out after Kent State. We held nice. uh, candlelight vigils. Uh, uh, Paul Stuckey, Noel Stuckey from oh, I love Mulberry. Them. I lived, love them. He he would uh, jam and lead the marches uh, back then. Uh, in my high school, uh, what's his face? The uh, the William Kunstler, the Chicago Seven's okay. defense attorney. Oh yeah. His daughter was a teacher in my school. Oh uh, my. So we we had you Jersey or New York? Where'd you New grow York. up? Which- New York. Where in New, where in New York? Long Island? No. No. <laughs> Upper East Side? Upper West Side? Well, no, I was born in the Upper East Side, uh, but I grew up in Larchmont, New York. Oh, I know. Okay. Nice. Maranac High School. And Did, you know, um, wasn't Joan Rivers from Larchmont too? Yes, she was. She graduated yeah. the same high school. Mm-hmm. Liz Sheridan, who played Jerry Seinfeld's mother I in his it, series, his mom. His mom. my high school. My classmate Michael O'Keefe, who. Uh, interestingly enough, when he got his first national commercial, we were in rehearsals for a show I had written and was directing and co-starring in because in my high school theater company, which was really good, uh, I was never getting a part that uh, I thought was worthy of me. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. so I wrote one. Oh, and we, had a, we had something called experimental theater, which uh, in between okay. the fall play and the spring musical students would write direct you know create their own shows so i did my senior year and uh michael o'keefe was my co-star and i get a call as we're waiting to start dress rehearsal and it's michael saying who wasn't michael at that time he changed his name for the union uh saying I'm I'm getting cast in this national Colgate commercial. I'm going to have to miss the first performance of the show because that's when we're shooting. And I was like, so basically I have 48 hours to replace you for one performance. Oh my fucking. But there it is. A little paper program from that show. First time he was ever billed as Michael O'Keefe. So I take pride in that. There you go. But yeah, we, I mean, our school was very activist, very, a uh, lot of people went Well, I can tell that. you one thing, just in my, and this is anecdotal. No, it's everything I've ever read too. All of you guys who grew up in New York and my partner grew up in Long Island. She was born and raised in Long Island. Um, 
you all knew about activism, regardless of your uh, how you were, what little pocket you were growing up, you knew about things like that. And your schools supported things that nowhere, nowhere in the Midwest, nowhere down South, nowhere else, we were not, no one else had yeah. any. And my, my, oh, my girlfriend, um, she went to Northport, <laughs> Northport High School, because she's from Northport, Long Island. And um, she was so proud to tell me that, because she doesn't know pop, she's a, she was always an athlete, so she didn't care about um, pop culture or stuff. She oh, have you, and you love sports so much yourself. Oh, so. it's my favorite. <laughs> I'm sorry, what were we talking about? Oh, um, and uh, she says, oh, uh, a famous person went to my high school and she knew this because someone told her, because she's older than, uh, that Patty Lapone, um, because I remember when um, Jay was telling me, she said, a famous person went to my high school. Um, she's a big star on Broadway or movies or something. And I can't remember her name, but she's telling me all this. And I'm, and I do like a little research, you know, um, I don't think we had Google, it's 10 years ago. We had it, but you know, I don't know what I did. And I went, um, Patty Lapone. And she goes, yeah, I think that's her. And I'm like, so you don't know who Patty Lapone is? And she's like, she went to my high school and she's famous now. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, she's a Vita for fuck. <laughs> well, you know what? Not just Patty Lapone, her brother Robert Lapone. I imagine. Because Robert was in the original cast of A Chorus Line. Oh, I didn't realize that. He was the oh, voice you, of the director that you heard from the balcony until the end. Oh of my the God, show. I may have heard him. And then there was this <clears throat> God awful. Uh, show about John Lennon. They had three different people playing John Lennon at different points in his life. It was an off-Broadway show. It lasted about a day. Uh, and Robert Lupone was one of the John Lennons. So, oh, no. Yeah. What was it called? I don't remember. I, I, mean, wondered, it, I just it, wondered. It, it struck awful. a chord with me as if I read something or I didn't see it. You know what I mean? And I was like, that sounded... I actually, I, somewhere over here, have the program because I keep all my programs. But uh, it was awful. <laughs> it was really awful. <laughs> well, we can't all um, love everything we've done. I'm, no. I'm, I'm humiliated most by uh, the thing I'm most not proud of these now in my life is when I was 19, I was in the Miss Lancaster County pageant. It's not a beauty pageant. It was one of the- Oh, you didn't tell me America. this. If, if you win, then you go on to Miss Pennsylvania. If you win Miss Pennsylvania, you you went go to Miss America, right? Okay, so it was, it was run just like the Miss America pageant. It was all very very straight laced. Very you have to sign a contract that you're a virgin, a lad. Uh, yeah, you would have had to obviously. A lot, a lot, because they also <laughs> ask me ask if they tell you you'll get fined and all this shit if you terminated a pregnancy. All I'm just like, rah, rah, rah. but um, when the, when I you get down you get whittled down to twelve girls. And then they have a show that night in some place in Lancaster at this big um, amphitheater or something. And when you walk out on the catwalk, they want you to write so write something so that the announcer can read it as you're walking out and coming back, right? And I said something, and it exists now somewhere on a VHS is um, me walking down in my prom dress that I uh, was reusing because I didn't have the kind of money to buy gowns and shit like that. And it says, and Suzanne's very interested in theater and she hopes one day to be the female Woody Allen. Bummer. Uh, well, that, that did not hold up well. I, I, hey, at least you got into comedy, you know, that's, that's good. <laughs> no, and, I mean- and, and what a lot of people do not know about you, you are also a well-trained actor person. I am, I, am. So, I know it's weird, right? Yeah, it is. But I mean, I've that's a handful of times. But you know, I miss it now that I'm not taking class. Maybe I could just take class again. Um, now I'm not taking class and I'm older, so I don't get cast every once in a while and something little. So much of what I've done was independent stuff. So it doesn't, I don't know if you'd ever be able to find it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but um, I've offered you one. So I don't mind that. I, I don't, I don't have a thing about that. But what I mean is, uh, I, I can't, when people say, have you ever been in anything? They want to hear the TV show you were in or the movie you were in, the thing that you did that was, you know. Um, I did, I was in, wait, what was that called? Arliss. Oh, the, uh, I loved that show. Well, Robert. Robert. Uh, uh, Wall. 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 Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I played as everything that I ever, almost everything I ever got cast in that was seen by anybody. Like, so it was like on cable or it was a, an independent movie that um, got a little play somewhere or maybe was on something. I played a Jew. Interestingly enough, not a Jew. 
Not no, Amish. Really? I know. Westenhofer isn't the Jewish name. What's interesting is about that is when I first was bartending in Jersey, lots of Jews that would say to me, well, you're Jewish, as I would speak to them and I would go, Westenhofer, and they would go, German, of course you're a Jew. Like German Jews, right? Who all came over here. They thought my mom was probably in the Holocaust. And I'm all like, I met my first Jewish person when I was 21 years old. 21 years old. Can you imagine? No, not really. I mean, but it's bizarre. I mean, when I look at that now, I'm like, what? Then also eh, three, four years ago, did my DNA. 1% Ashkenazi Jew. Really? I love it. I've even been welcomed to the tribe Ooh, by many baby. members. I know, I'm loving it. Because I, I always thought Jews were better than everybody else. Oh, good, a, good, a good. Suzanne, say that and get the rest of us in trouble. That's going to be right? great. That's, no, by the way, that's what every fucking Jew says to me. Well, I'm always like, I'm like on your side. I have a, I have a reverse racism, a, a bias that's amazing. And I'm so aware of it. And they're like, no, no, don't. Quietly, we appreciate it. But, you know, don't say it out loud. We don't have enough trouble as it we is. Try, we try to keep that down. We try to keep that down. <laughs> And, um, but I actually, the, the most bizarre thing is my whole life, my identity, my brand, if you will, has been that I'm the little German farm girl from Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, right before COVID, so I got shut down with these thoughts. I did my DNA and my half sister uh, got very involved in finding out where the name Westenhofer comes from. So she did my dad's uh, genealogy all the way back to um, England. And um, so these are the things I found out. One is not German. None of us are. The Westenhopper name was because uh, the English uh, um, landowner got one of his girls pregnant and he gave, or, I'm sorry, the German landowner got a girl pregnant who was a little Brit. So we're all British, we're her kids, oh, but he was cool. German guy, right? So we barely have any German in us, but he had to give her the name so that it's a whole thing, but we don't have any German in us. We're Scandinavian, Scanda fucking Navian. Well, and apparently the name was Von Westenhopper because Westenhopper isn't long enough. It's um, like you're on a sound of music or something. We're, exactly. We're from the, they, they haven't gone, she hasn't gone back far enough to find how far we are. Like, but we're like in Austria and all that, not, you know, that whole, we're not, we're Scandinavian. We have nothing to do with um, Germany. And I'm like, my whole life, I mean, I'm like, Oh, I'm German, but I don't speak German. And German people think I'm German when I'm in, every time I've ever been in Germany or if there's German, a lot of German uh, tourists somewhere where you are, they always come right to me. And I'm like, I don't speak German. <laughs> and I would say things like, I did stuff in my act about Germany and how I was German because, but I don't know anything about Germany or German. Like, I don't know it. I mean, I just would do it like to be, to mock myself. Like, so I drive a Mercedes, but I had a Volkswagen, but they're both the same. You know, I mean, just stupid stuff. Now, all of a sudden I'm like, What's Scandinavia? I don't know jack shit about those people. Who are they? I, I cook German potato salad. I cook pork and sauerkraut. I cook German food. I don't know anything about it. My mom believes it's a lie, but we're not German. And then the second thing I found out, which you will love, maybe you won't. No, you, I don't know if you guys knew that. When I was growing up, the, uh, we were so poor and it was the whole thing about the main line outside of Philadelphia. Uh, which is this area outside of Philadelphia. Jews aren't allowed to live there. They weren't when I was young. Um, nobody with the last name that ends in a vowel. It, ah, it's the yeah. white, it's the white upper crust. It's everything you've ever heard. It's the it's the Astors, it's the Vanderbilt. It's and that it's ironic crust. given the Jewish population of Philadelphia. So but they um it was the wealthy. It, it, there's a whole thing, it's called the National Social Register, and it's the list of names of the uh, surviving. Uh, people and families of the 50 pilgrims who survived when they came over on the Mayflower. Because 100 of them came over, only 50 lived the first week. They lost like 50 people. They died of something sickness. And those 50, and they're considered Americans, real Americans. Yeah. Well, when, when anybody talks to me about the pilgrims and all, oh, you know, the Puritans, heinous. it's like, yeah, these are the people who were so obnoxious with their religiosity Indeed. that nobody in Europe wanted them. One of the yeah, send them to Massachusetts Bay Colony. Get anywhere, them the anywhere. out of here. Get them out of here. But um, they trace themselves and they think of themselves as the original Americans and blah, blah, blah. And they're very wealthy. And it's a whole white, 
horrible thing. I've never cared about it, but it was, I was very aware that the National Social Register was a, a real thing with the snotty people. And um, I'm from, I've just assumed generations of farmers and factory workers. Cause that's all anybody knew. All, all four of my grandparents and the other grandparents, we've been in America forever. So I knew that, right? And so nobody did anything. Nobody had any money. Nobody, there's no chase. My dad, my, I am eight great, 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 great granddaughter of John Alden, who came across on the Mayflower, one of the original survivors, one of the only survivors. He helped create Boston. He created the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. There's a, a museum there for him and a home yeah. and stuff. I'm all like, what, what? And he was significant in our culture with, uh, so th th there's a poem by Wadsworth. Yeah, there's a whole story about him. Whole thing, I know. And I'm like, what? So now I'm, I'm A, I'm an original American, whatever, uh, not, because that Basel would be the big <laughs> Right? But it's so weird because I'm like, everything I thought I knew about myself just isn't true. So where'd the Ashkenazi Jew come from? Um, I'm thinking, here's my thought, honestly, you know, we say things like Germany and Ireland and Italy, but if you ever like look on a map, we did that. It's like, it's like the size of Wyoming, the Dakotas, all that thing. Right. Yeah. And then we go, oh no, you're German. Oh, well, no, you're this. Oh, you're this. But that nature didn't make those little lines and little countries. And the like borders that. kept changing anyway. So. Right. And I'm, I'm just assuming that. I, I, I bet go back far enough, like another generation, I probably have, even, I don't know, might have even more, but you and I know, I, I, how many of us there can, can there be? How many, everybody's got a little something, something in them. Yeah. Although my partner gets her DNA done and I, and she thinks her family, Long Island, uh, her parents and uh, been in the country, their country, you know, like six generations, something like that. They've been Baptists forever that they're very proud of. Like who's, who's On proud Long of that? Island? That's what I said. I said, not Jewish, not Italian. I can't even be friends with you. Um, do you understand you're in Long Island? Yeah. Um, they're in that weird part out there that just, that it's almost like <laughs> Trump, Trumpers and stuff like that. Yeah. I didn't know that even existed. Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, but she gets her DNA done. She is 89%. No one's 89% anything. I mean, a handful of people are, but that's right. A lot. British. I'm like, did your family ever fuck anyone outside of the family? What the <laughs> hell? I mean, I have, I'm, I'm like 6% African. I've got East African. I've got West African. I've got um, Eastern Europe. I've got uh, Ashkenazi. Um, I've got a, the, the, a fragment of Asian, like a, like a fragment. I've got stuff. You know, my people Suzanne, went around. you've got we, a routine we, here. We traveled. We fucked people we liked. That's all. There you go. There's your <laughs> there's your new routine. I mean, that's a good bit. It probably I, I, you're probably right on. Yeah, I may not be able to get up on stage and do the stand up anymore. You can come but and I know see what me works. Laugh. Huh? You can come and see me and laugh. Oh, I would love to come see you and laugh. Everybody else is laughing and really loving it. You can go like this. I told her that would I created that bit that's, for her. That's me. No, I, you know what? I coached stand-ups in New York, so. Oh, did you? Yeah. I, I, I love that you say coached stand-ups. I hear people saying it. I teach comedy or I teach stand-up and I always think, do you? Who teaches that? You can't teach that. It's, it's not teaching them to be funny. It's. Yeah, you can't. It's, it's working with them. Working with them on how to. Develop, to be use themselves. Develop use yourself, develop Perfect. your routine, your meth, your stuff from your experience. Right. You know, and how to, and, and I, I, I can teach, like I can teach coach. I, I, I coached a couple people and I have a, I'm have a mentee right now that I'm working with, um, teaching the timing of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like the rule of three, how K words are funnier than, you know, that, that kind of, just some of the yeah. little dorky stuff that you just want to get in your head and it starts to become natural. It was always natural to me. So I didn't have to learn the, t that part, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, me too. Yeah. And it was to her, but she wasn't using it when she wrote her jokes. So she was taking like 
six months of doing the same material and it was that joke wasn't working and it was just because she didn't know how to take herself out of it and go this is funny why isn't it working oh because i have too much space between when i set it up and tell the punchline and they kind of they drift off timing it's all yeah. about timing so all about timing so suzanne yes should, my love i i, I promise I promised my audience in my last show, I wasn't going to talk politics in this show, but I've got mm -hmm. you here and we're political animals. So how do we not? I mean, especially with everything going on. I mean, you how do you not? It's right, I, the, ever since Biden was elected, not right away, but ever since July, January 6th, um, I would say within about, about, like a, three weeks after that, I, really was having trouble watching politics on the news. I still did it, but I was, ha I just was having trouble. Yeah. I just was really like, it doesn't matter anymore. Nothing. I was walking around like that. Nothing matters anymore. It's over. This is what's going to happen. Those people that I thought, first of all, were only like 10% of the population. Looks like they're 40, maybe 30, 40, if we're lucky. Right. That and, scares uh, the shit out of me. It scares the fuck out of me. And it says to me, they're going to, they're going to get ahead because liberals and and uh democrats and you know we're tree huggers we're we're commune people you know we're not going to ever ban you know we're not we're not going to get a group even if and that's what scares me i'm we're I'm never going to do that kind of stuff that and apathy i'm horrified by it and i so i just i was really having a hard time bouncing back from it like get you know yeah i understand I completely. a little bit I, I imagine you are too now we have the the one year anniversary and i'm like and some of the responses, I mean, I'm just devastated by the- all, all I am at this point is I wanna see indictments. I wanna see these people held responsible. I wanna see the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Boberts and the Matt Gateses taken down because they deserve to be. And did you, can I ask you this? Until sure. Trump was in office, did you have the murderous rage that you had? Cause I never had, I've had rage. I never, ever, not Nixon, not Reagan. And I was in New York City for the whole AIDS epidemic as a lesbian. All my friends were fags who were dying. I never wanted anyone dead. Like I might say it because I'm a comic. That's how we got, I hope we fucking die, right? Yeah, but don't I, tell Kathy Griffin. Uh, the, didn't work she, well for her. <laughs> yeah. And I, but like, this is the very first time and I remember, I knew that it was over. I was never coming back from it when they said that uh, Trump had tested positive for COVID. And I remember just thinking, oh dear God, and I was like, please let him die. Please let him die. Please. And I was doing that and I went, oh my God, who am I now? <laughs> right. And yeah. then I was, and then even that didn't shock me out of it. I went, no, I'm fine with it. And I went, oh my God, this is how we, this is how they are. This, you know, Trump was trained. He was the mentee of Roy Cohn. Thank you. I love that you know that too. And when you understand that and who Roy Cohn is, you know, and, and, and also that, um, and I don't know if this is true about Roy Cohn. Did, was he trying to get his dad's attention too? Uh, I think his dad was gone, but his dad was not, I was not a real hands-on. It was his, he was mama's boy. Okay. And my father knew him oh, and geez. loathed him. Over here is my only award for acting best actor i played roy Cohn in angels in america and, on stage yeah and i could have seen you not on broadway i, I mean i only it, saw it once it was <laughs> regional it was a regional okay. theater still it was geez. great production yeah really really well done uh our director in Bucks county pennsylvania and no it was not okay. uh but but you know i went to my dad at the time because he knew Cohen. So yeah. oh. I said, tell me about him. And all my father could do was spew his venom towards this putz. Um, but so I've, you know, I've known what Trump was in, for 40 oh, years yeah, or more. Oh, yeah, you. Whoa. And so, yeah, when you talk about that anger and that just pure rage, yeah, I've never felt anything like I have since I woke and he, up and they said he's he president. Um, and aren't you 
shocked by it, not only because like me, you've been political your whole life. Um, so we've experienced it. We've been, I've been out marching. I've been in marches. I've been yelling. I've been, you know, getting shit thrown at you, all that other stuff. Um, but you get to a place in your, in your life where you're surprised. I'm shocked by a new, like, oh, I have this too. I can be so angry. I want people to die. Like you, when you get to be 50, you don't think you're going to get a new thought. You know, like, or, or like I, I said to my girlfriend only a few months ago, I said, I couldn't get my hair. I wasn't doing it right. It was all fucked up. And I said, I am too old to not be able to do, know how to do my hair. That should not be something that now happens. Consider it inspiration. Something new after 50. Inspiration. It may not be a positive inspiration, but it is inspiration. I love that you're a good person, though, ultimately. You can't help yourself. Yeah, no, you don't, you don't want to feel that way. But, but the fact of the matter is, there are people whose removal from the gene pool would, would not hurt us. Prove things. You know, I, my, my phrase that I like to use for these people is they are walking advertisements for mandatory euthanasia. I'll uh, go with it. Yeah. It's, it's, are. <laughs> how come not, what is it? All the people who are uh, protesting abortion are the people that are basically advertisements for why we should have it. And remember, hey, George Carlin said, how come people who are pro-life are the people you wouldn't want to fuck anyway? <laughs> it's true. You know, they're living abortions. Uh, We're mean. I, 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 I can, you and I could get so down and dirty with this because we, 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 we frighteningly think along the same lines. Yeah. But that's, I guess, I like you know, it though. that's my honorary lesbianism. It's not just that. I think, I think the thing that connects us more than anything is that from an early age, we got, we had an understanding and we were good with this understanding that um, there's a place for us, but there's a place for everyone. And it's okay for you to help people who, who or, or to care about people's having their place too. Like it, it's not this singular focus of my success, my success, my success, right? It's a, I want success, but I'm also, I want you to have it too. I hope that works for you too. Like we have yeah. this way. And I that's- I feel bad when my friends succeed. I no. feel great. Right. I'd like to join them, but right. yeah. And I don't know if that's just have, having alert parents or good parents, or just really the fact that um, I, I think that um, there's this, that underlying story of being an American of like pull yourself up from your bootstraps and you can make it has, 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 cr has fucked us a little bit. There, it, 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 it's too much and it's weird, it's not true. And there's a whole crowd of people that think we can't help these people with welfare. We're supposed to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. Oh. You're freezing. Something. Wait, you froze again. I want that routine in. <laughs> oh. The bootstraps. Am I, oh, yeah. Well, because they're saying they say we can't help these people on welfare because we have to um, uh, teach them to help themselves. And if you help them once, then they'll never learn. And then oh, they won't. All work. the usual bullshit that's, they say. That stuff is very American. It's like ground into our society that that behave that thought process i i got all that propaganda when i was a kid too sure, we all did we and right. and we also got the propaganda about how great this country is uh forget all the genocides that our country has yep. propagated all the crap because they don't want, and, and now they are openly trying to stop kids from learning about it i can't this is this is the here's what here's why i know we're living through through an extraordinary historic time 50 years from now, they will teach about this period of time and all the nightmares and stuff. Somewhere they'll be teaching it. Yeah, you know? somewhere. And um, one of the things they're gonna say is, and unlike the hellacious book burnings that started in, I'm gonna say 1920, I'm just making up something, right? The book burnings of 2020 were unbelievable. You know, I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be worse. It's frightening and funny at the same time. But when you look at the reality of it, it's terrifying. Uh, Did you see the latest? Yeah, you had to have seen the one. Is it was it this morning or yesterday morning when we woke, when we woke up to the teacher? It's in the Midwest. The, he's at a school board meeting, I think, and they're saying something to him about teaching Nazis or you know Nazi oh, Germany. Be, being fair. Look, you you can't be taken the side. You can't make your opinion known that the Nazis were bad. 
We have to teach it in a way that lets the kids decide whether killing people and dragging them out of their homes, just because the fact that they were a different race than you were, is bad. You, as a, as a teacher, it's not appropriate for you to put your own, are you fucking kidding me? Oh my God, I'm like. Oh. He apologized. He apologized. Wait, which for, one? The teacher? The teacher apologized for oh. that they were bad. Yes, yes, I saw I, that's I, the part. I, I can't with this. This is it. We're, we're, we're heading down the ugliest thing. I don't know how, I always think comics can get us out of anything. I mean, like, you know, that we're Americans, right? You know, we'll do, the, now I'm going, we're, 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 it's too far. It's so far and we're split. And when people say divided, we're not even divided. We're, we're like sectioned off like um, oranges and stuff. There's so many. It, well, especially now, because you have, so many of the people who were actual Republicans, as we right. used to think of them, are Republican. now Democrats. So our party goes from here to here. Their party is right here, focused, concentrated, goose stepping uh, in, in line. But and the people in charge, meaning the people with money, yeah. um, people with money can always, use, they need that crowd. That's the crowd. They would never be with them. They'd never touch them. It's the Trump never. thing all over again. But they need them to stay that anger, right? And to fight all yep. of us for our rights and make us think that this is all going to happen. Get them all fired up, right? Because then they don't have to do it and they cause unrest and they get them fearful of this, that we're afraid, that we, we, we're worried. We're not fighting the guy with the money because we're worried about the 50 guys with the hunting rifles who are coming to our back door. Yeah, it's it's... You know, it's, I don't know how to describe it. I, I've gotten to the point where there is just so much on a daily basis that I, I could become catatonic. I could, you know, with, with fear or with just going insane at the crap you hear on a daily basis and people saying things that you sit there and go, my head Do you hurts. Hear yourself. I get. Don't you get? Phys I get like physical, actual headache, like an actual or like a heart, like a heartache. I'm like, I'm physically feeling my misery of this. Well, it's hard for me to tell if it's residual COVID or not, but yeah, I, I <laughs> you get exactly what you mean. So, but let's let's wind this up on a positive note. Something good. Uh, have we got something good? Uh, for me, I do because we're. I live in LA, and we've had ten days, maybe twelve, maybe two weeks of um, it. We, we got rain, lots of rain, and it's been chilly. It was even down to forty one night, wow. and um, we weren't getting over like sixty degrees in the day. We had four days when we didn't even get above fifty five, which wow. in LA is insanity. This morning, as I don't, you can't. It is seventy five and sunny outside. Oh look! At, oh, nice big screen. I'm looking at the TV. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's beautiful. It's sunny. It's LA again, baby. Sure, we're basically still shut down. And there's no one on the streets. But if we go out on the street, it's nice. And that's what I care about. <laughs> and that is why I love you. Because I'm you a weather pussy. I'm willing to, I'm, I'm going to just say it. I like my weather to be temperate. That's it. Well, that's why you've been in LA for so long. Twenty uh, years, dude. East Coast girl. Uh, hey, listen, I'm ready to head to Canada <laughs> on a moment's notice. So, you know, and I don't like the cold particularly. Well, we got to get a group of us so we have enough money to buy something where we can have the heat on all the time or whatever. Do whatever it will be the appropriate thing so that we're warm all the time. I am with you. Mm -hmm. And on that note, especially with the beautiful big screen TV you showed us in the background. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank uh, you, honey. We I, did it. Sort of. I'm so glad we did this. Um, hang for a second after I say goodbye to the audience, but because I want to talk to you about something, but I am so proud of us. We did it. No, I, and, I, and, and, and we didn't spend the whole time talking about everything. Personal stuff that didn't really. That nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. So, thank you, hey, Suzanne. Did you get that thing on your cheek fixed? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do have a scar here? Uh, so, Suzanne Westenhofer, if you have not watched her comedy, uh, you can 
see a lot of it on YouTube. Uh, I know, I don't know who, who does that, who puts all that stuff up there? I don't know, but I've been watching a lot of it. Um, okay. And soon, soon, Suzanne is gonna be back in the clubs and you have to go see her. And hopefully she'll be uh, invited back to the Stephanie Miller show because she was doing really good oh, stuff. I, and I want to be on her show Steph again. Heads love you. And I want to be on her show again. I, I want to. I want to come in and be her. Um, uh, how we're how we're surviving COVID shutdown. Uh, like go well. We're going to talk to Suzanne. She's taking the cult toll. I like. I want to be that person. Like. So we're going to wind this up by my saying, Chris, Travis, Steph. Here's Suzanne. Don't make do, you really me want, do, do you really want to give her to me when you could have her? I mean, come on. Hmm? We can do both. Anyway, thank you people for being thank here you. and joining Suzanne and I for this wonderful, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm going to call it, conversation. Um, and I'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves. Be good to each other. And don't take any shit from anyone. Wave five. Wee.